Well, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in. This is the first session of a series of sessions um, that we call the Job Search Series. And this is sponsored by TCAN and ONTPD. And this is just a really great um, series of kind of lectures and panel discussions to help prepare you guys for the job search series, no matter where you are in your residency pathway or fellowship pathway. Um, I found it personally very helpful when I was applying for a job during fellowship, so I'm excited to help kick this off. Um, my name is Bree Liberio. I am a neonatologist at Indiana University, and I'll be moderating today. Um, and I'll go ahead and introduce um, some of, well, these are the before introductions. I'll go through some of the upcoming um, sessions within this series. So today is the first session, like I said, um, and it will be kind of an overview didactic session as well as a um, big portion of it will be a, a question and answer session. Um, and then upcoming, we have details about private practice jobs, academic jobs, some interviewing tips and tricks. And then later on in uh, the fall, um, there will be a session about negotiations and job offers. And something that's really unique to this um, series is that you guys can all submit questions beforehand and we will do our best to try to answer these questions to the best of our abilities um, during, um, Sorry, there's a software update. Okay, during um, these sessions. Um, so that's something that I really liked about this job search series as well. So today we have three really great speakers. Um, first, we will have Dr. Nicole Dias um, speak about details of the individual job searches from last year. And this is largely based off of some of the um, survey data um, that we have received through doing this for a couple of years. Um, Dr. Dias is um, a neonatologist at the University of Colorado, and she's also the TCAN Education Chair. Next, we'll have Dr. Patrick Myers speak about understanding the roadmap and timeline of the interview season. And he is um, one of, he is the fellowship program director at Northwestern University and Lurie Children's, and he's been part of this um, uh, series from the get-go. And then finally, we will have Dr. Heather French talk about preparing your CV and marketing yourself. She is also the fellowship program director at um, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and both of them are ONTPD chairs and very involved in that as well. Um, so a wealth of knowledge for you guys today. And then finally, we'll close out the session with um, a Q&A session. Um, and this is going to be addressing some of the questions that you guys have submitted uh, prior to this session, but also feel free to type questions into the chat and it'll be my job to try to get those all organized and try to figure out the best way that we can all um, answer all the questions that you guys have submitted. And so without further ado, I will have Dr. Dias go ahead and start us off with a few housekeeping um, items about this series. Excellent, thank you, Bree. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so as a reminder, today's session is being recorded and will be sent out to all who have registered for this session. So if you haven't already done so, please register using either the link that we send in through the chat or the QR code on this slide. Um, thank you for all of you who submitted questions. And like Bree said, um, throughout the, today's talk, if there are other questions that come up, please send them her way and she will try to incorporate them into today's presentation. Um, as a reminder, we will also be sending out a post-session uh, evaluation survey today. Um, so anything that any resources that get sent out through the chat, and we've also over the years have created a job search series handbook and resource guide. So for all of you who fill out that post-session survey, the link for that resource guide and handbook is at the end of the survey for you guys. Um, you'll see other QR codes throughout sprinkled in throughout the rest of the talk. And those are the QR code for the post-session um, evaluation survey in case you have to hop off early. Um, and then Zoom links for the other upcoming sessions will be sent out closer to those session dates. Next slide. Oh, perfect. 
And so my job today is I'm hoping to give you a bird's eye view over some of the topics that we're going to cover today and throughout the series. Um, there's been a lot of frustrations over the year about a lack of transparency and structure when it comes to the job search. So our lives have been fairly structured throughout our education and training with set dates for application start cycles and due dates, set times for interviews. And the job search is not like any other um, prior stage in our training. And so a lot of prior preparation for the job search has come from word of mouth, who your prior um, fellow those who just underwent the job search are. And so our hope is that by collecting data from everyone who's utilized this series and from graduating uh, third year fellows that we're able to give you more details about individual surveys, uh, individual job searches so that can provide a little bit more structure and clarity as to what this process you're about to embark on is. Uh, next slide. So at the end of the year, we've been sending out a survey in past years to gather this information. And so last year's survey went out around February or March, um, and it went out through the TCAN Fellow Listserv, which contains about 98% of all current third year fellows. Um, and so from that group, about half of them, a little over half of them accessed the survey and completed it. And this had representation from um, the entire kind of different regions throughout the United States. Of those 52% who filled out the survey, 89% underwent a job search, about two thirds looking in academic um, medicine job positions, about 20% uh, looking at private practice jobs, and then the others looking at kind of hybrid um, practice models or looking into both fields or other um, smaller buckets. Um, the majority were told by their program to start their job search late second year. And what I mean by that is starting to prepare the documents that you'll need for the job search, or some programs told them to start in early third year. Um, of those who did not have a recommendation from their program or decided to go against their program's recommendation, the majority of people are starting in that late second half of the um, second year of fellowship. And that's more so for traditional graduates. We, we recognize that there is a sizable group of our fellows who are currently uh, working under a visa or uh, looking for a job positions through their visa. And so we have a dedicated talk that we've done in prior years um, for those residents. And we'll put that link into the um, slides as soon as I'm done with my section. So next slide. So here on this slide, you can see some of the resources used by our survey respondents to identify jobs. And you can see that the great majority of our fellows are utilizing something called cold emailing or calling programs in order to find um, the jobs that are out there. And this is a huge source of frustrations for our trainees where there's not a centralized um, area where people are just kind of posting their open job positions. And um, Dr. Myers and Dr. French are going to go into more details regarding the resources that do exist out there in order to find these jobs. But the majority of people are, are using cold emailing or calling of division chiefs if they're seeking academic positions or straight to um, medical directors of, of different practices in order to find out whether there are going to be job availabilities at that practice or not. Um, there are a handful of people who are using online job centers and mailing lists, and Dr. French will talk a little bit more about those resources. And then, of course, your fellowship program leadership are a huge resource for you, that as we are a small community, and a lot of program directors talk to one another in regards to who is hiring and who is not. Next slide. We also collected data on what were the components of the job search that cause the most stress. And, and we collect that data in order to share it with you so that you have a, a general idea of 
of things that are going to be causing you stress or, or things that we're going to struggle with. And so by far, the leading contributor to stress will, is the different timelines of different jobs, especially if you're a person who is applying to both the academic realm and the private practice realm. And Dr. Myers is gonna talk a little bit more about what those different timelines look like and how they compare and contrast. Um, other things that are contributed to stress is if you know, you're a trainee who has um, a limited geographical preference personally as to where you are finding jobs, be it from, a, from uh, numerous personal factors that are um, restricting your job search, and then also finding that there are limited job availabilities in that kind of narrowed down um, scope that you're looking into in, in, in regards to um, specific geographical regions. Next slide. What uh, There are a lot of questions submitted that talked about how many programs should I be looking into it or, or division should I be looking to send my application? And although there isn't a one size fits all and a lot will depend on your um, individual circumstances, here you can see that a good majority of about 69% or so of uh, applicants last year um, submitted their application to one to six sites with smaller buckets submitting more than um, six applications to six different locations. Next slide. In regards to job interviews, you can see that the majority of people are interviewing at one to four different uh, locations with, with smaller buckets interviewing at um, significantly more locations. And when it comes to the type of interview that people are going to uh, post-COVID, we are seeing a swinging back into in-person um, job interviews. Um, you can see that in that third column on the first chart, uh, that there's still a good number of locations who are using a telephone screen prior to inviting out for a formal interview. Um, so I would still expect that that may still be a process that you um, experience this year. Next slide. There were some questions in regards to how many job offers do people um, usually receive? And again, that's going to depend on everyone's individual circumstances, but I provide this data here just so you can get a general idea of how these job searches are going. Um, now, I will say caveat to this slide is that we sent out the survey in February and March of this past year. And by that time, you can still see that there's a lot of job offers and job interviews that are still pending around that time. Um, the second table on this slide, we collected data about the amount of time fellows and, and early career neonatologists were receiving in order to make a decision after a job offer is extended. And you can see that the majority are, get, are receiving about one to two weeks after getting a job offer to, to make a decision. Now, that's not set in stone, and you can always reach out um, to whoever's extending that job offer to ask for an extension. But right off the bat, most people are getting one to two weeks um, to either accept or decline a job offer. Next slide. There were some questions submitted that talked about by when should I have a job lined up during um, fellowship? And, I, and again, it's going to depend on everyone's individual circumstances, but here is what happened last year. So you can see that the majority of um, individuals who completed our survey were receiving contracts in the December through February time period. Um, and again, a lot of offers were still pending at that time as well. So even going into spring and early summer, some people are still waiting for the official contract signing to take place. Um, in regards to contract negotiation, which we do have a whole session on um, towards October of this year, so more to come on that. But as far as our survey um, respondents went, uh, the most commonly things negotiated for was uh, the start date of a particular job and sign-on bonus. 
uh, 88% of our survey respondents did state that there are numerous things within their contracts that were non-negotiable, most common being things like salary, cost structure, and then the non-compete clauses. And uh, Dr. Myers and Dr. French will speak a little bit more into these details later on in our presentation. Next slide. The takeaway uh, point from this slide is that this is going to be a process, right? There's no, no defined um, time marks or time periods, but it does take a particularly long time to go out into the job search and to locate a job, especially if you're looking more um, at academic job positions than private practice job positions. And you can see that the majority of our survey respondents uh, stated that they spent about four to six months um, looking for a job before getting a job offer and a sizable um, chunk also longer than that. Next slide. Thank you. Um, and my last slide here is just a just kind of a summary of some of the top advice that uh, people who underwent the job search last year had for you guys. Overall, they uh, one of their leading um, advice was to start early. And that's not necessarily reaching out to programs, but start the process of collecting your materials, self-reflecting as to what would be your ideal job positions. What are you willing to compromise on? What are you not willing to compromise on? So start that process now. Um, and Dr. Myers will talk a lot more about what this self-reflection process looks like. Um, next was to be persistent. Uh, don't be afraid to follow up multiple times if you haven't heard back from a particular institution or practice. Don't be afraid to cold call or email in order to identify job positions that are open. Use your social net connections. Again, our community is fairly small and a lot of people know one another or can reach out to prior connections that they themselves had during training or, or collaborators that they have with their research in order to inquire on your behalf in regards to job positions that may or may not be out there. Um, again, very important to identify what is most important to you prior to undergoing the job search. Um, some advice about applying widely and outside of your institution, even if you're hoping to stay at your particular institution. Um, benefits to that are, a myriad of benefits in one, having more than one job offer. If you have, if you find yourself lucky enough to be in that position can make negotiations a little bit um, easier or a little bit more straightforward and also allows you to see what all else is out there in order to compare and contrast different types of positions and job op opportunities. Um, update your CV regularly. Hopefully that is something that you continue even past the job search and into your, um, careers moving forward. It's very stressful to, to apply to a position or an opportunity later on in life and, and, you know, at the last minute, try to update everything that's happened in the past few years. And so I hope you, you take that practice into whatever your next transition is. Um, one of the advice themes was don't sign too soon and be patient. As you can see from prior slides, this timeline is quite extended and a lot of things happen later on in the year. Some uh, institutions, especially academic institutions, aren't ready this early to really look at their um, the composition of your of their division and, and decide whether um, they'll even have openings for for positions in the upcoming years. Um, second to last is identify how you stand out and what you can bring to the institution or practice. So back to that, the importance of self-reflection before you undergo the job search. And then the last theme um, was keep an open mind and be flexible. Next slide. All right. Um, before we start Dr. Meyer's session, um, thank you, Dr. Dias. That was really, um, really helpful. I enjoyed the last slide with all the pieces of advice. Um, one question that has come up in the chat, um, and Dr. Dias, feel free to answer this, or I guess we can also open up, open it up to Dr. French and um, Dr. Myers. But the question is, if I if I am train or if I have been training in a, oh, did it just reshare? Okay. I'll ask the question. 
Um, if I um, have been trained in a level three NICU, how difficult is it to apply for a level four NICU job? So what, how I can start us off. What I would say is I would imagine that your future employer will ask um, that of you during your interview. Um, oh, I noticed that you've only, you know, you've had experience in level three. What have you done to, to prepare um, to work in our facility? And I would be ready to answer that question. So if you have the opportunity to rotate through a level four, which not all of us have that opportunity to do so, um, I, you know, would take up that opportunity and showcase how you have prepared yourself to work for a level four. I would research their particular level four and the, and the patients and diseases that they see, and then would, again, showcase and sell yourself as to how you'll be able to tackle, tackle um, working in that new environment. Dr. French, Dr. Myers, anything to add? I can um, say that, you know, most of the, the biggest difference between a level three and a level four, obviously, maybe the complexity of the patients and, you know, the um, degree of or the number of subspecialty um, consultants that may be involved in the patient's care. But most, um, you know, all level four NICUs, for the most part, are affiliated with an, with an academic institution. I, you know, I think there are very few level four NICUs that are private and not affiliated with the university. Um, and most university hospitals are going to have uh, junior faculty mentoring programs and even junior faculty, like within your own division, you'll have a mentor that is like your clinical mentor that's sort of assigned to you to be that point person to help you. Um, we'll probably review your notes and other some, you know, clinical decision making to make sure you're feeling comfortable. And then, you know, if your level four center has an, an ECMO program, um, you would likely have to go through just for JCO an ECMO course to be able to care for patients. So if a, if a level four institution is interested in hiring you um, because of your unique skill sets or other needs, they will train you. They will provide the training that you need. So don't let it, um, you know, if your fellowship program was level three heavy, don't let it deter you from applying to level fours. Um, they will, you know, definitely adjust um, to help support you succeed. I mean, I think it's it's a little hard to do. Is my is the I think the brutally honest answer. But I think that the other thing to understand is often in the large academic centers where most of the level fours are, um, often research is the currency of the land. Meaning, if you have something to offer. Um, the section chief or um, institution needs. Um, that is often the way to do it. And it may be if you really want to get to a level four and, and only did level three, um, you may need to bridge where you do some um, work at a community partner um, and negotiate, you know, a couple of weeks um, at the level four. And then like Heather said, people will train you up. And then over time, you kind of like shift that uh, focus to more level four. Great. Um, we have another question for um, Dr. Dias. So you talked a lot about the timeline and how it can be somewhat protracted at times. Um, what time should you ideally have your job lined up during your third year of fellowship or second year of fellowship for some people? But <laughs> We'll talk a little bit more about the timeline um, in this next section that Dr. Myers is going to do. And I will generally say that that is a very difficult question to answer because it is so individual specific. Um, I would say for in for my past fellows, uh, the majority have had a job lined up by March or April of their third year, but they started the process in the summer fo following their second year of fellowship. But I've also had some who've had their job entering third year. I've had some who've had their job it, by the end of that first semester of their third year, but I just find the variability quite large and so difficult. Uh, I don't think there is a clear cut answer to that question. 
uh, Dr. Myers, Dr. French, anything you would add? Um, so I think it, it depends on if you're applying to private practice or academic jobs. Um, I think now these are big generalizations, but most academic centers, um, you know, are depend, dependent on like the Department of Pediatrics budgetary cycle, which is not, it doesn't operate on the academic year, it operates on the fiscal year, so January through December. And so most academic divisions won't have their budget um, kind of approved until January. And so oftentimes most academic centers can't make offers until after the first of the year. Whereas private practice, when they have much more um, control over their own operating budgets, can offer positions earlier than that. No, that's broad strokes. There may be academic centers that know um, they have money set aside to hire that may be able to hire sooner. But you'll find that in general, most academic centers are going to provide offers much later than private practice. Um, we have one more question before um, starting the next talk. Um, and this kind of goes back to two questions ago. Dr. Myers, I think you were talking a little bit about um, mentors and clinical mentors. So someone has asked, are there clinical mentors in the non-academic setting? I think you touched on it in the academic setting. I mean, I worked private practice for four years before starting uh, in academic medicine, and um, there were always um, senior people who uh, were there, um, usually the unit direct director or the uh, managing director of the private practice group who was invested in kind of getting you up and running. Uh, I think neonatology is complicated enough that even if you're an extremely good fellow, there's still lots to learn for the first many years after you graduate. Um, and any good private practice group will have a either uh, explicit or implicit uh, mentoring uh, group or person. Um, you know, I think one of my first days that I showed up, my new boss gave me his phone number and said two or three other people did as well and said, call, you will, don't worry, right? Uh, everybody does. Great. Okay, there's still some questions coming in, but I think there we might touch on some of the topics um, in the next couple of presentations. So I will keep them reserved to the end, um, but know that I'm keeping track of them. But I will hand it over to Dr. Myers now to continue our um, session today. So anyways, I wanted to, I think the the, this is kind of a new part of kind of your experience, because I think that often people, you know, you match into residency, you match into fellowship, and often this is one of the first real jobs that people have to find, and there isn't, it's it's amorphous, ambiguous a little bit, and I think what, one of the things that one of my former fellows said to me um, at some point when I was kind of reflecting about the job search with her was that she said, you know, Patrick, know what you want in your heart of hearts, it will make job hunting easier because I think that there really isn't a perfect job. You will always have to make some uh, balance a little bit between your family, location, uh, research acuity, um, how much money you wanna make, uh, familiarity. I mean, there's a lot to be said about staying where you, you trained, right? Um, for me, uh, collegiality and my colleagues was really important. Do you wanna go somewhere where people push you a little bit? Are you looking for research or clinical mentors? Um, is the work environment really important? So I would say that like, it's actually really critical uh, when to have like done a lot of this homework uh, before you even start the job search about like, what are your goals? Uh, what do you absolutely need? What are your deal breakers? Um, and what are things that you would like? And what are things that aren't important to you? So the other thing is, and we've alluded to this, is the timeline is going to be really different. Um, you know, I think people are really used to kind of like, you know, you, you apply for the match, you have some interviews, you have a match date, right? And there are a couple, um, you know, or in fellowship uh, programs, open their files, you have your rank list due. But these little green arrows are um, over the last couple of years, just kind of when my fellows 
have gotten jobs. And you can kind of see there is a huge variety of when people get jobs, right? There was one fellow once who got kind of poached by a private practice group in June, and I've had people sign um, contracts in May. Um, I would say that, you know, kind of late November through March is probably when most people are going to have their final contracts. Um, so this is kind of the way I envision um, going through your job search or what things you should be very roughly doing. You know, by June, you should have your CV and co cover letter done, ready to go. Um, Heather's going to talk a little bit about um, in a lot more detail about this. Um, and I would say that by the, the beginning of June, you should have identified a list of programs that you, uh, be it private practice or academic, that you are interested in applying to. And you should try to um, have a contact for all of those people. But I think the other thing is um, to think about is that the job search will evolve over time. And so just really keep going. Um, don't stop trying to identify programs. Don't stop trying to like find uh, new places to go. And I think that's one of the things that's really been interesting to me is that uh, where uh, fellows that I had that I kind of am working with think they're going and where they end up going and where they're really happy with are not always the same thing. Um, I would say in kind of early July, start emailing uh, your potential. Uh, bosses. It's a little bit tricky. Um, and there's some individuality of this. Uh, my boss, you know, will get um, emails, CVs, cover letters in June or before. And I know he's always irritated because he's like, now I don't know where to put these people and I'm going to forget some of them and I've got to print out the CVs. And um, so I would say after the July 4th holiday is probably a good point to start emailing potential jobs. Um, some people will not respond to you. Almost everybody will have kept the email uh, filed, file it somewhere, printed out your email. I think it's more than appropriate to send a um, short email out um, in October, and then again, another one in January, February. And the, the flavor of these follow-up emails should be um, very short and to the point, basically saying like, hi, I'm still available in the market. Your program really intrigues me. If you have an opportunity, I would like to talk. Um, interview, your first interview is often somewhere between August and uh, February. Um, the second one, uh, often in the academic centers, you're gonna be asked to do a job talk, it will often be between January and March. Um, and offer letters, as I said, often will come in somewhere between March, uh, sorry, November and March. Uh, and contracts can be as late uh, anywhere from the offer letter to the um, the end of the year. I would say, and I'll talk about this a little bit, the last part that people don't think about is that um, you need to really, um, as soon as that offer letter is in and uh, contract is in, uh, you need to start working on credentialing and state licensing. So how do you start this whole thing? I think this is the hard part because there aren't any hard and fast rules uh, like there is for residency and fellowship. Um, I would just say start talking to people, start talking to your program director, your section head, um, alumni, research mentors, faculty, APNs, um, residents you went to med school uh, for now that you kind of have a goal of where you want to go. I would say a couple things. One is your social network is much, much bigger than you think. Um, and your community that you work with really wants you to succeed, right? Like you've been there for three years at this point and people are really invested in you finding a job that is satisfying for you because I think it reflects on the program. So I think occasionally fellows are fairly private about where they want to go. Uh, I can see that and being an introvert, I can see why that might be the case, but I actually think it, it does you a disservice. I think the more you can say, tell people your goals, uh, tell people where you want to go, the better. I mean, it's, it can be as random as I was on a transport once uh and the um we were just talking about where my fellows wanted to go and the um the ambulance driver was like oh yeah i like i actually work in the uh, mainly work in the nicu at at fill in the blank uh nicu and i know they just posted it they they're they're just opening a job and guess what the one of my fellows got a job there so 
talk about things broadly and know that people really are going to advocate for you. Um, I'm going to leave, just keep this very short because Heather's, Heather's uh, Dr. French is going to really talk about just, but be extremely careful, edit, edit, edit some more. Um, and I would just recommend having an individualized CV and cover letter uh, for all the people you talk to. Um, how do you initiate uh, contact with programs? Um, once you've got your list made, I would send a very short email, attach your CV and personal statement. I think that one thing that fellows don't sometimes realize is that if you're sending it to a practice manager uh, or a section chief, these are people that can get 200 emails a day. And if you send a 1,000 word artfully created, um, um, very long uh, email to somebody who gets 200 emails a day, they are going to have the world's most searing tension headache. So a short email that has a CV and a well thought out per personal statement so that they can look at it and think about it when they have time is actually a much better way to go. Um, once you start initiating contacts with programs, ask the people that you know um, to advocate for you. It's a very small community. We do talk to each other. Um, most people should be happy to call up their friends and colleagues at the program you're applying to uh, and advocate for you. Um, if you haven't heard from, pro from programs, like I said, um, kind of October, um, January, try to do it after holidays, not right in front of holidays. Send a brief short reminder saying you're still interested um, and giving people the opportunity um, to contact you back. I would also set, start um, keeping notes of all the programs you've started to, um, because the programs will often start to seem very, very similar um, at the same time. And it's important at some point when you're starting to make a decision, you know the details or they will call you up and ask and assume that you've remembered the details. I, when I, during my first job search, I had uh, not one, not two, but three different Toms that I was uh, engaged with in terms of trying to find a job. And each of the Toms would call me randomly uh, and it was really like confusing at some point. And I was very glad that I just, I just carried a little notebook around with me. And so I could tell who was who and what they were asking about. So um, after the, um, after you've uh, gotten your first interview offer, um, I would just say like a little caveat is know what your fellowship does in terms of handling time off. Um, you know, when can you get off? How can you get off? Uh, what does it mean in terms of service and call and things like that? Um, most jobs will send you a list of people who are going to interview you. I would say really research the people who you're going to interview. You know where they went to med school, residency, fellowship, what papers they've done, anything you can, because people are really hiring you for your long-term potential, what you can offer to them, but also they're hiring on relations, right? Relationships and um, there's some plus or minuses to that, but, um, you know, it's not like a three-year obligation. This could be a 20-year relationship. And so um, having some ability to converse with people um, is, I think, really important and a good way to make an impression. Um, I personally advocate um, that you make a list of five to eight questions that you can ask every person. Um, if you happen to get stuck with somebody who's really shy or like socially awkward and they run out of questions to ask you, um, it is... It does. It, it's your job to kind of keep things rolling. Um, just having seen a lot of fellowship interviews, the people who get dinged the hardest are the people who had an interviewer uh, run out of questions and the interviewee ran out of questions. Like it just is not a good thing. So just keep rolling. Um, make sure that you keep talking, keep asking questions, even if you think you know what the question, the answer is. Um, you really just always have to be marketing yourself during uh, the day. It can be really long. And then as soon as you're done or as soon as you have break, take notes and, and really like be thoughtful and reflective about what people have said and what you've answered. So uh, many, uh, perhaps most or all uh, programs will offer you a second interview. It really means that people are quite serious about you um, and Generally, during the second uh, interview, this is the opportunity for you to understand the job uh, better, find out details, how much call, how much service, which unit are you going to be in, what are your obligations beside um, call and service. 
Um, often, what will you be paid? What are the benefits? Um, and I would say very globally, part of the second interview and even the first interview is really think about what can they offer you, um, but also what can you offer them? Um, I would say uh, sometimes faculty uh, or programs will say, who do you want to talk to? I would really advocate that you ask to talk to junior faculty members, uh, potential research mentors or site leaders, because these are the people who will actually make or break the program for you um, on a day-to-day -day basis. Junior faculty, it's they should be frank with you. You can ask them questions about like, how well are you supported? Um, what do the junior faculty think of this place? Um, because you're, you know, you could talk to some 70 year old full professor, tenured full professor, but like their experience is just gonna be radically different than your experience. So like I would advocate talking to the people who kind of like deal with the nuts and bolts of your day to day job. Um, you may be asked to give a job talk. I would 100% recommend that you give your job talk many times before you actually give it in front of um, your interviewers, give it to your program director, your research mentor, a group of faculty, their job is to ask hard questions so that when you get into the interview and give your actual job talk, uh, they it will go smooth and you know how to handle everything that they're saying. Offer letters. Um, so if they like you, they will send you an offer letter. And what is an offer letter? It basically spells out what the job expects from you, what the job will give to you. And unfortunately, there is a huge, huge uh, amount of variability. I've had a couple different jobs. I had one job offer letter that basically said, You're, we're offering you a job. You have 30 days to accept or reject this, this um, offer letter, and um, you will do what the uh, section chief wants you to do. And I've had another offer letter where it said, you will have 52 calls. You will have X amount of service days. You will have these many vacation days. You will sit on this committee, you know, and so they can be quite explicit and they can be quite vague. You don't really have a lot of um, say about what's the off in the offer letter, um, though you can start using it as a point of negotiation. Um, as Nicole said, like I say, thirty days to accept or reject the the letter. It's actually closer to three weeks, um, but often it will really depend on how desirable the job is. Um, I had a fellow who had one weekend to accept the job because it's in a highly desirable, highly competitive market and they had 30 other applicants for that job. And she asked for the weekend. I think that letter was on Friday and she asked for Monday and they said no. Um, and I've had people as, as long as six weeks. Um, the one really critical thing for you to know about offer letters is you don't have the job yet. It may not, it isn't legally binding, right? Um, and I know that during COVID, I think two or three pro programs rescinded offer letters. So most people will honor it. It would be extremely uh, rare to uh, not honor an offer letter and actually would be really frowned on broadly by the program directors uh, and the larger community. Um, so um, Nicole, uh, Dr. Dias, like, talked about this a little bit. It's really the hardest part of this, and it's really hard to believe at this point in the cycle, but navigating multiple opportunities is really hard. When you have somebody offering you a job or saying you have, you know, 10 days to, to um, negotiate, to say yes or no to an offer letter, um, and you're still waiting for an interview or you have an interview that's in 20 days, right? Like, how do you balance the um, the competing offers. And I think one of the things that happens here is that the private practice um, groups hire earlier and the la large um, academic centers, because of their um, budget cycles, because they're really administrative and bureaucratic, um, will often hire late. And I think this is somewhat deliberate on the private practice groups is they know that they can get better applicants if they poach them early. Um, I would say one of the things is is to be honest, right? Um, and and say things like, I'm actually, I have an interview in in uh, 20 days. I know your, your offer letters wants me to be back in uh, 10 days. I would really like to honor that interview. Um, would you be willing to extend the offer, your offer letter by an additional two weeks or something like that? Um, so the trick here is to be honest, but not um, blunt. 
um, potential employers should um, understand this dynamic. And I think the one thing that people don't realize is most people have, that are hiring have hired you know, 5, 10, 20, 30 people. Um, but this is really your first um, rodeo. Um, be aware that once the, the, the offer letter is there, unless you can kind of ask them to push it back. And, and I've had experiences where people have pushed offer letters back for me, if you ask nicely. The clock is ticking. Once the offer letter expires, you kind of are, it's a little bit like breaking up. Uh, you have to start over from scratch. Um, and I think this is where I say from that very first slide, know what you, you need in your heart of hearts. Because I think that when you have multiple things um, that you want or opportunities, um, it can be really hard. And it's having that pre-made list of what's important to you is really important. And just be aware there aren't any perfect jobs. But you know what? You'll get there. Um, everybody does. So the next step is as a contract, right? Uh, and again, when the contract arrives um, can be quite varied. Um, I would recommend that you get a lawyer to review your contract, um, particularly if you're going into private practice. Um, the academic contracts are quite hard to negotiate because they, they have, um, they're written in boilerplate. Uh, there'll be non-compete clauses in there that, um, are really meant for associate and full professors, but they hold everybody to. Those are, you could ask to have them removed. Occasionally it happens, but um, it would be very rare. Um, private contracts um, are, are much more open to negotiation. Um, so what can you negotiate? So private practice, you can probably negotiate anything. Um, call, service time, money, uh, bonuses, uh, call thing, but just realize that uh, it really depends on um, how valuable you're perceived to be and how much they need somebody. And I think they're, the good thing to know is that in October, we're going to talk a lot about negotiations and contracts. And I think that's probably a, a place to think about it. Academic, you probably can't really negotiate money um, and, and maybe service time as much. Uh, but you can, um, and I would encourage you to, to um, use competing co uh, offers to ask um, for additional resources or money. So I think one of the good ways you can do it is often section chiefs will have different buckets they can pay you. So they may not be able to pay you more in salary, but they may be able to give you more book money. And you could say that, hey, you know, I, I really like your institution, but this other institution is offering me $20,000 more. Um, could you offer that in a salary or, you know, hey, give me more money to travel uh, or conferences, or can you give me a um, research staff or statistical programs or fund a master's? And the more ways you can get a section chief to say yes to you, the more likely you are to. Um, and this is just a reminder that the NIH um, and multiple organizations have shown that um, Female neonatologists um, get paid significantly less when they start, and that trend stays throughout um, people's career. So um, think about how, and I would really encourage you to negotiate. Um, so the other thing that's a little random, you actually have to think about, you may not be able to control this a lot, but actually know what you're getting into. So there's essentially two different types of uh, insurance. One is a current is an occurrence policy. So if this the policy starts and you provide care here, and during an occurrence thing, if the policy ends right here and somebody there's a malpractice claim during occurrence, occurrence basically means that it doesn't matter if it's one day or 20 years after the fact, because you had an occurrence policy, um, you were covered. The premiums may be higher. Uh, but the coverage period never ends. And for a occurrence policy, you don't need tail uh, coverage. And I would say that is almost exclusively what fellows and residents and large academic centers um, use. Claims made is a little bit different, right? Um, so you provide care, the policy starts, you provide care. If during the policy being active, when you actually have an active claims mail policy, you file, there's a malpractice claim filed, here you're covered. But if you end the policy and um, you provided care here, and five years later, uh, the kid has ROP or something like that, 
and they file a claim five years after your policy ends, you are not covered in, during a claims mailed. And this is where tail coverage comes in. So the benefit of claims made is very early on. Um, it's pretty cheap. Uh, eventually, like it will get a little bit more expensive. Um, but you, um, if you have a claims made policy and you switch jobs, um, you will need tail coverage. And actually, sometimes if, as you move from job to job, um, you can ask the new uh, your new employer to cover your tail. Um, this is just a quick reminder that depending on the state you work in, uh, the credentialing that you need, um, it can take a long time and it can potentially affect your start date and potentially affect that first paycheck. So my advice to my fellows is get started on state licensure and credentialing the moment you know you actually have this job. I would say uh, reach out to the section chief or the, the uh, practice manager's assistant and say, um, I've been offered this job. What do I need to do next to do state licensure and credentialing? And the more aggressive you can be about that, the happier your boss will be with you and the more likely you will make that first paycheck on time. Um, this is just a personal thing is these are my fellows, my first year fellows, but I would say pay it back to your co-fellows. By that, I mean is once you have a job, you're not competing with anybody. So I would say share your list with the younger fellows, like all the contact people, the admins, what you thought of the jobs, what you, how much money you got made. Maybe even like my fellows have a fellowship list of all the contacts, but all the jobs over the last five or six lists, years. Think about like creating a, uh, and maintaining a standard list. Um, I would say find time to meet with everybody the years younger than you. Talk, you, talk to them through the experience, be there for them. What, um, and that I would say is advocate for them when they're applying for jobs. Um, common questions. Um, how do you navigate a job with a, a partner? I think it's just really hard. I mean, I think my wife's a neonatologist and we're off sync by two years. So this has actually been an issue for us for a while. Um, I would say be relatively honest about it um, as you're going through searches. I think it's not an unreasonable thing to tell people that like, I'm really interested in um, job hunt, you know, my my wife or my husband or my partner's um, family is um, from Milwaukee, hypothetically, um, and so we're really interested in the job here. But it's difficult, right? And I think that it, it requires, um, how much do you make is another common question. And it's, it's I'm always a little, I feel a little cringy about answering this. Um, the, there's a great paper by uh, Renata Savic, um, who talks about neonatal salaries, factors, equity, and gender um, that will give you a better sense. But very, very roughly 200,000, but there's a huge amount of variance, bonuses, uh, call, pay, and a bunch of things. Um, I would say also really work hard on trying to figure out what the fit job um, and the interviews, like actually like how well you're going to fit into this program, because I think your partners matter a lot. Matter a lot. Um, and that is all I have. I will stop sharing and Bria will let you, you take um, take over again here. Great. Yeah, there were um, a couple of you had asked about what is a job talk. And I think Dr. Dias um, addressed that in the chat, but I don't know, Dr. Myers, do you have um, kind of an explanation for what a job talk is? Sure. And I think, I mean, Heather could give a perspective as well from a different institution, but um, most academic uh, institutions want to know what your academic uh, contribution will be to the field. Um, and they will ask you to reflect on the research you've done as a fellow, future directions, um, and your understanding of the field. And so it's a think in some ways, I think about it as like a summation of what your fellowship research has been about and what your interest in fellowship has been about, and hopefully also some potential future directions you would like to go in. And so I think it's actually, that's quite hard to do for a fellow and do it well. And so that's why I say, please do this many times with people in your um, home community who are really going to advocate for you and make this slick and help you think through some of the nuances that as a fellow, you might not understand. Great. And some of our questions are being addressed also just through the chat. Um, in the essence of time, we'll get um, the next one started. So Dr. French, 
Um, if you have your, I can share your slides or if you have your slides up. Uh, no, Brie, if you don't mind sharing them, that would be great. All right. Um, and I can say, you know, if you have a job talk, um, we actually make our fellows, um, we, we, I shouldn't say make, but we strongly encourage our fellows to actually practice their talks in front of an audience of faculty so that we can give them feedback um, and help them refine their talk to really make sure that it represents all of the awesome work that they have done during fellowship and what they're hoping to accomplish in you know, their next um, phase of their career. So I'm going to, um, again, I'm Heather French. I'm the fellowship program director at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Um, and I'm going to talk um, a bit about, you know, the nuts and bolts of putting together your CV, your cover letter, and then also um, just kind of review some of the resources that are available to you as you move forward in this process. Next slide. So, you know, I think the first thing that you have to believe is that all of you are coming out of, you know, fellowship, you're well trained, you have experience with acute and chronic illness, you've done, you know, QI work, you've done scholarly work, you've developed didactic and bedside teaching skills, you know, you really do have marketable skills, because I think sometimes people are like, well, what do I have to offer? You have a lot to offer, and you have to believe that in yourself. Um, so I think the um, next slide, please. I think the next piece of this is, you know, you really have to do some self-reflection. You have to find your focus. You have to contemplate and prioritize what your goals are for your career. And really, um, I would think about it as opposed to thinking about, you know, the next 30 or to 40 years of your life, think about it in smaller chunks. What do you really want to be doing in five years? Where do you want to be doing that work? I mean, is there geographic areas that you would prefer to live in for a variety of reasons, whether it's family or the pursuit of outdoor activities or something like that? Um, what are your family commitments? Um, how flexible of a job do you really need to have if, um, you know, you have a lot of little kids or, you know, whatever, you know, you're taking care of um, elderly parents? What types of clinical opportunities are you looking for? Do you wanna work in a level three or a level two or a level four? Um, are you willing to work in a level two? I hope the, that the majority of you um, coming straight out of fellowship are not looking to spend a great deal of time in a level two. I think you'd be quite bored. Um, and that's probably a better transition as you get um, further out in your career. But you know, if you have to do level two time, how much are you willing to do? Um, how many NICUs are you willing to cover? Some you know, practices will cover several NICUs. How much driving is involved when you have to provide coverage in a variety of NICUs? And is it in-house or home call? Now, most academic centers are moving to in-house call. It's gonna become a JCO requirement. But private practice, perhaps that's not the case. And you know, nurse practitioner or APP coverage is enough. So you really need to think about what you want. And there should be, you know, a job out there for you based on what you are looking for. Because truly the answer, um, uh, next slide, please, or is, you know, this is when you really spend the time to think about this, the answer to this question is going to guide your entire job search. So you have to really be thoughtful about this process. This isn't something that you think about for five minutes. This is something that you really spend many weeks thinking about, talking to your mentors about, talking to your partner about, um, talking to your, you know, if you have research, um, you know, thinking through where is the best place for you to grow your career. Next slide. So, um, you know, you, as part of this process, you need to start thinking about what are the strengths that you will bring to your future employer. Um, if you are struggling to identify what your strengths are, talk to your faculty, talk to your mentors, um, let them boost your confidence and really make a list of your strengths because you're going to use that list of strengths when you write your cover letter. Um, think through how your strengths will make you a strong candidate for a particular type of job. Next slide. 
And, you know, I, I put this in as a placeholder because at the end of the day, the job search really does require you to be your own cheerleader. And I know that self-promotion is something that can feel really uncomfortable for people, um, but there's no one out there that is going to promote you as well as you can promote yourself, not even your mentors, your fellowship leaders, your division chief, because you know, at the end of the day, what you're looking for, the, the particulars of what you're looking for, and what you envision as your strengths to be. So you have to be your own best advocate. Okay, next slide. So um, Patrick had mentioned that by June, you really should have, you know, a CV, you know, put together, um, you know, and that is very true. And you really need to begin right now, getting your CV together. Um, because what you want is your CV needs to tell some sort of story. Um, you know, so for instance, if you want to go out on the market and say that you are, are well-trained and able to take on the role of, you know, QI leadership within a division, what have you done over the course of your fellowship to prepare you for that role? Your CV has to support what your cover letter says you're looking for. So, that your CV really needs to have items on it that support your growing expertise in a given niche, whether that niche is, you know, research or QI or medical education, or really just that you want to be the best outstanding clinician you can be. Um, and so your goal with the CV is to demonstrate through bulleted, you know, descriptions of your training and accomplishments that you are a qualified for that position that you're looking for. You need to show your productivity. You know what you've had a lot of you've had a lot of service time but you've also had a lot of protected time. And what have you done with your protected time? Um have you done the bare minimum scholarly work and you know like had marginal participation in a QI? That's okay if you did, but recognize that that's not going to give you get you a job at an academic center that really is looking for a track record of productivity. So, you know, you need to make sure that you are identifying areas where you can demonstrate leadership um, and administrative skills. They Administrative skills, no matter whether you're going to academic or private practice, are really important. So what committees have you been in part of? Um, you know, all of those things need to be listed. And if you can show your initiative um, in your CV, you are one step further than an applicant that hasn't doesn't have the opportunity to show their initiative. So these are really your goals. You are communicating your productivity and your training and your qualifications through a bulleted list. Okay, next slide. So when you think about your CV, you also want to think about who's actually going to be looking at it. When you send a CV out to a division chief, it is it is now available to many people at that institution. So it is available to the divisional and departmental leadership, as well as anyone that might be interviewing you. It's going to the hospital credentialing committee, the medical college, if it's an academic institution or the whole, everyone in the practice group your CV is going to be read. So it really, you need to be aware it's being read for content and the people that are reading it are going to value substance over style. So don't play around with fonts and, you know, the different types of, um, you know, size font and colors and everything. Make sure that it is readable on an easy scan. Um, and, be honest, you know, this is going out to a very broad audience. So everything that is on your CV needs to fully and accurately reflect what your roles within different projects has been. Um, there are, you, you know, sometimes you have two different versions of your CV, um, especially if you're applying for two different types of jobs. You know, if you're applying for a private practice job, you probably don't need, you know, all the different research projects that you've been involved in, although that does show, you know, productivity and um, a degree of ambition. But, you know, it is okay to have two different versions of your CV, depending on what type of job you're applying to. Um, next slide. So if you're struggling to even know where to start in terms of how to structure a CV, all of your 
academic institutions will have a kind of recommended CV format that you can get through faculty affairs. So this is just the one that the University of Pennsylvania, which is my um, academic institution, has online. Um, and you can see that it's very simple, like there's no flowery font. It's just, again, substance over style. So um, if you don't have a CV um, format, ask your program directors to provide you with one. Next slide. So nuts and bolts of putting your CV together, Heather, is um, you need to make sure that you have perfect spelling and grammar. You know, if you don't have those things, it just looks like you're not paying attention to details. And we all know that details are the very heart of neonatology. So you really need to make sure someone is proofreading it. Um, and many people are proofreading it. You want a very clear font um, that's not too small. So, you know, 11 or higher um, or larger with normal margins, and you really are trying to emphasize readability. Again, you want bullet points, you don't want it in paragraphs. Um, spacing, appropriate spacing and bold font can draw attention to certain areas and you don't need any extraneous words in your CV. Next slide. And when you get your um, CV, you know, a, a formatted CV from your institution, you'll notice that there are a million different sections that can be a part of a CV from academic and cl uh, clinical teaching to invited lectures to awards. If you don't have something that fits under a category, don't list none because then you're just highlighting your shortcomings. So if you haven't won any awards, don't have an award section on your CV. Um, because if you have to put none underneath something, it just doesn't look as good. Um, next slide. Or, oh, and don't list the same accomplishment twice. Like this comes up a lot. People will get, you know, they'll submit an abstract to PAS and it will get um, uh, accepted for a platform presentation. And so then somebody decides to list the platform presentation as both an abstract under their bibliography, as well as an invited um, lecture. Don't do that. Just pick one place where um, an accomplishment should live. So don't duplicate things in your CV. Next slide. So um, some people will have a, a kind of statement of academic goals or personal interests. Um, it's not required in your CV. You can choose to do so, but really your statement of academic goals and your interests really is going to be in your cover letter. So there's no need to, to reproduce it. I mean, if your institution suggests you do it, go for it, but it's not necessary. Next. Um, again, ask your faculty members to review your CVs for accuracy, impact, and comprehensive contact uh, content. I, as a, a program director, review every single one of my fellow CVs, and I will go through it with a red pen and, you know, cross out things that I think don't need to be there, like, you know, your high school jobs. Um, I'll help them adjust their formatting. And I always say, like, I'll put at the top of their CVs when I'm editing it, okay, this fellow wants to go out in the job market and um, advertise themselves as, you know, an expert in um, patient safety. So then I um, will look through the CV to say, does the CV tell the story that this fellow has developed, you know, growing skills and expertise in patient safety? Um, and, you know, I help the fellows make adjustments or we may identify areas where like, oh, you have a deficiency here. You haven't learned this skill. Let's get you this skill. Um, so that way we really can, um, you know, show that the fellow is prepared and ready. Um, next. And again, just you have to be honest and proofread, proofread. Um, you can lose a position if your CV is not correct, even it's, if it's a totally honest mistake. Uh, next slide. So I, I just put this on here. This was um, the CEO. Uh, this was from a few years ago, but the CEO of Radio Shack um, was this guy, uh, David Edmondson. And he exaggerated his academic credentials on his resume and was fired. So again, I mean, this is a drastic example, but you know, you have to be honest. Next slide. Okay, so the cover letter. Um, you know, I think 
The CV is meant to be a look backwards at your experience and where you've been. And then the cover letter should focus really on the future and what you want to be doing. So think of your cover letter as sort of the bridge between the past, which is represented by your CV, and the future that explains what you hope to do next and why. Um, as Patrick had mentioned, um, you don't have, we don't do snail mail anymore. Everything goes by email and you'll send your cover letter with your CV when you're contacting a program by email. And the cover letter is usually three to four paragraphs. So next slide. But, um, before you actually start writing your cover letter, and again, everyone has mentioned that every cover letter needs to be personalized to the institution to whom you are sending it. Do not send out a generic cover letter. And the reason, um, you know, you, you have to do your research first before you send out your cover letter. You need to look online. You need to find out as much as you can about the institution and the, the division and the group that you're applying to, because what you're looking to do is identify areas where that institution is strong and areas where that institution may need more support. And perhaps that support can come in the form of you and your skill sets. Um, you know, you might want to identify who could be a potential mentor or identify faculty members that are engaging in similar lines of academic work. Um, if, you know, the nice thing about TCAN is it provides a really lovely network, a fellow um, network, reach out to fellows in that, you know, at that program or in the area and find more about, find as much as you can out about the culture of that institution. And, you know, I can't emphasize enough how important it is to network. Um, and you really should start now. Hopefully you guys, um, some of you were at PAS and you had an opportunity to meet, um, you know, a bunch of people in the field, but networking is huge. Next slide. Okay, so the cover letter, again, three to four paragraphs. So your first paragraph is really an introduction and you wanna open strong. Who are you and what is your connection to the program that you're applying to? You know, if, if you want to, if your program is, is um, in your home state, you know, this is where I grew up. I've always looked, I've always looked forward to coming back to home state X, Y, or Z, or my partner has a job in this state and I'm looking, you know, for a, a, a position in a specific region, state that. Um, but don't just say I'm applying to you only because I need to work in, you know, this particular city. You can say what your connection is to. And then what type of position are you looking for? So I am a, you know, current third year fellow at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. I'm eagerly looking forward to moving back to the Boston area, which is where I grew up and have a lot of familial ties. I'm looking for a, you know, 80% clinical position in a dynamic academic center where I can employ my skills in medical education, teaching, um, and, you know, whatever it is um, in your division. That would be a, a great opening paragraph. Next slide. So the second paragraph should be somewhat brief, but it is about your exceptional training. I trained in a um, very busy and highly acute uh, level four NICU where I obtained skills in, you know, ECMO, medical transport. I have, um, you know, tons of experience like with all different types of ventilators. And also because I want a job in medical education, I have done a certificate work um, at the Graduate School of Education. I've been involved in X, Y, or Z, right? So you now use that second paragraph to sort of say, this is what training I have received. Next slide. So then the third paragraph is really about the program. And this is where doing your homework first makes a big difference. So why are you interested in that program? What is it about that job that is appealing to you? Um, is it appealing to you um, because of the opportunities for exceptional mentorship? Is it because they have this fascinating clinical program in craniofacial reconstruction and you've always had an interest in, in that? You know, what is it that is a very appealing about the program? And then what unique qualities or values are you going to bring to that institution and what activities do you hope to be involved with? 
Um, and that can be academic, it can be clinical. And you know, what are your professional goals? Again, it is totally fine to state that you're interested in the geography of the program as well, but you have to have another interest in the program. That can't be the sole interest. Okay, next slide. And then your last paragraph is really summarize again who you are, what type of job you're looking for, how enthusiastic you are about the possibility of working in Institution X. And here is a list of people, that, which should include your division chief and your program director, and perhaps one of your, you know, your research mentor or your clinical mentor, who can speak to my um, exceptional training and abilities. Um, and I look forward to hearing from you in the near future, you know, sincerely. Um, and so that's really what your cover letter should look like. Next slide. So the big do's and don'ts in a cover letter, you, you really need to convey enthusiasm. And while you are selling yourself, you have to watch your tone a little bit. You have to you know, kind of thread the needle of you know, patting yourself on the back, but also being authentic about who you are and not sounding egotistical. Um, you want to demonstrate that you understand what that division needs. Again, do your homework and then keep your cover letter short and succinct and get feedback. I read every single one of the cover letters that my fellows send out. Um, you know, I help them refine their message um, and it gets reviewed thoroughly for, you know, again, content, grammar, and spelling. Things that you shouldn't do in a cover letter, don't try to be funny. Don't try to have like a hook line, like, you know, sometimes you do in a personal statement. Don't send a generic cover letter. And don't go overboard with the flattery because that, you know, feels a little um, Eddie Hask Haskellish. Um, just, you know, be honest um, with what you're looking for. Next slide. So as, you know, Nicole had mentioned about how people approach programs, um, really networking is the first place you should start. Um, you know, approach people at meetings, even virtual ones. Um, before going to PAS, I reached out to every one of my fellows and say, who do you want to meet? Who do you want me to introduce you to? And I made those introductions for my fellows. Um, if you have a poster and a poster session, you know, stand by your poster and talk to people who approach you. You just have no idea who you're potentially going to meet. Um, and then, you know, ask your mentors and your faculty to introduce you to people they know in your field of interest, whether it's clinical or whether it is, you know, an academic research area. Um, I make e-introductions all the time for my trainees. And if I don't know someone, I reach out to my faculty and say, who has a connection to, you know, this field or this person at an institution? Your program directors want you to succeed. Your program directors know that it looks very good for their program when their trainees go out and get great positions. That is a great advertising and recruitment tool. So your program directors want you to succeed. They want to help you. Don't hesitate to ask them for their help. Um, next slide. So when you approach a person, again, authentically self-promote yourself, use multiple sources, reach out to faculty, have faculty make an introduction. Um, when you are sending an email, um, you know, I would follow up three times if you don't get an initial response to your inquiry. Um, you can email or call the um, depart or the divisional assistant to inquire if your CV was received and if any additional information is needed. And as Patrick had mentioned, if there's not a job currently open, ask if they'll keep your CV on file in case there's a future opportunity. I mean, someone could have to move, um, you know, sort of out of the blue because of a partner or um, an illness in the family, or someone just decides at the last second they're retiring. So things happen, you know, sometimes quickly. And so it's nice um, you can have a CV on file with the program you're interested in. Next slide. So again, you're still probably wondering, well, how do I find out where, how do I like meet people, connect people? Where do I get, you know, sample cover letters? How do I get a sample CV? 
like your first stop really needs to be the TCAN website. So if you all are not members of TCAN, you need to join. I can't tell you how incredible TCAN is as a resource. And I so wish it was in existence when I was a trainee. Um, but if you go to the TCAN career development and leadership section of their website, you'll see that um, they have job search timelines, they have sample cover letters, they have sample CVs. So there are resources that are out there that already exist. And, you know, ask your colleagues or, you know, graduated fellows or mentors for their CV templates as well, just so you can get a sense of what it should look like. Next slide. So, um, you know, in terms of finding out how many neo, um, you know, neonatal intensive care units there are across the country, there is unfortunately not really one single accurate resource. Um, you know, NICUs are opening and closing all of the time, um, but there is a website called Neonatology Solutions. Um, it's free and it does have a relatively current NICU directory. Um, it lists that there are over 1300 level two, three and four NICUs in the United States. Um, that, you know, and it provides some details like numbers of beds or practice type. Um, there is also on this same website, next slide, um, they do have a jobs posting. Now, I don't know how often it's updated. Again, I think, and it's mostly, I think it's mostly focused on private practice jobs, um, but it does have some job postings available. So again, it's a, a nice place to start. Um, next slide. The other place that you can look is neonatology.net. Um, this also, um, I think this has a variety of both private practice and academic jobs. There are, it's a place for people to go post positions as well as for people to say, this is the position I'm looking for, you know? So if you are really looking to like go to Puget Sound, you could, you know, put that up there to say like, I'm really looking for a position in Puget Sound, can someone help? Um, so this is also a resource that's available to you. I'll also say, I think some of the, I'm not a, a heavy Facebook user, but I do know that like the physician moms group or the neo physicians moms group oftentimes can be really helpful. Um, there's probably, you know, something similar for, for fellows, but certainly join that group if you like. And, you know, you can say, I'm looking for a job in this area. Um, does anyone have contacts? And it works really, really well. Next slide. The other place you can look is on the ONTPD collaboration page. Um, you can see that it's not, hasn't been, you know, up, uh, updated in a while, but really because again, the things that are gonna be posted on the ONTPD collaboration page are really academic jobs. And so, you know, most places don't really have a great sense of academic jobs um, until, you know, kind of, at the nearing the beginning of the fiscal year. Um, so this gets updated periodically um, and it can be a place to go look. Next slide. Um, but really I think when you are, especially if you're looking for an academic job, word of mouth is huge. I always hear from other programs. Programs will send me an email and say, hey, just FYI, I wanted to let you know we're going to be looking for a job or we're going to be looking for a neonatologist. Do you have any, you know, fellows who are interested in heading to the New York City area or, you know, your program directors get a lot of emails. So I usually am aware of job postings. My division chief oftentimes will get emails from other division chiefs saying, hey, we're going to be looking to hire. Um, but again, it's just network, 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 network. Just don't, don't be afraid to ask. Um, but, and, and again, you know, we oftentimes are, all these jobs are sort of coming word of mouth. I mean, you might see like a job posting in the back of the New England Journal or the back of the pediatrics um, magazines. Don't use those. Like those get posted really because um, a position, an academic center has to have like, um, they have to have posted a, a job listing in order to be able to hire someone. But oftentimes once those go in, it's because they already have someone in mind for the particular position. So that's not a great resource for you. Okay, next slide. Um, you know, Patrick had mentioned that salary is always such a tricky topic. 
Um, the double AMC posts every year, they post a faculty salary report. Now this is just for academic jobs. So they don't have private practice job salaries in this report, but they do have the report broken down between public uh, academic institutions and private academic institutions by region of the US because the salaries are very different depending on where you want to live. And so this will have, um, you know, salary info that's pro that's usually about two years old, um, but it gives you a, a ballpark idea of, you know, what kind of um, salary you should expect if you're staying in academia. To get access to this, every academic library should have access to this, and or your university faculty development office should have access to this. You can go ahead and buy it yourself. It's like a hundred bucks if you want to get access to it yourself, but don't do that. Go to your library first and see if they have it. Um, and this, again, for academic institutions only. Next page. Um, there are, you know, you can do some Google searching. You may find, um, you know, some baseline ideas of what salaries might be. Um, this I found really interesting. This was from Doximity, and it was just talking about compensation by metro area. So, you know, the things that are shaded in green um, are cities that have the highest compensation, and then cities that are shaded in blue have the lowest compensation. Um, and you can see that, like, these desirable areas, I, I put desirable in quotes, um, not to offend anyone, but, you know, Denver is a cool city. People like to live in Dallas or Houston, the Eastern Seaboard. You know, they, they pay less because people want to live there. Um, you know, places where, you know, maybe there's less desire to live are going to potentially have to pay more or places that have crazy costs of living like the Bay Area. So, um, again, these are helpful resources. Just, you know, spend some time with your good friend Google. Next page or next slide. Um, Patrick had mentioned this paper um, in the Journal of Perinatology from 2019. Again, the data is going to be old. Um, you know, now it's three years old, but it will give you an, uh, you know, an understanding of some of the you know, like medians. And you can see the differences between, you know, um, uh, assistant, associate, and full professor salaries, you'll see, you know, how salaries vary across the country. So again, it can be just a helpful paper, but keep in mind that the data is old. Next slide. Um, this is also an old paper. This was from 2012, but I think, um, and it's in Neo Reviews, but I think a lot of the topics that are covered in this paper still ring true. You know, like, there's so much more to a job than just how much you're going to get paid. You know, what kind of fringe benefits do you get? What does your clinical schedule look like? How much, you know, flexibility do you have in terms of pursuing the academic interests that you want to pursue? Um, and so I think this paper is actually a great place to start. You know, when, my, when I started my kind of portion of this, it was like I said, you, the first thing to do is find your focus. What is it that you are looking for? And hopefully you're looking for more than just the highest salary you can get. Hopefully you're looking for something that can help build your passions. And so I would really recommend, you know, start by reading this, this paper, then go to find your, you know, then think about what you're looking for and uh, move on from there. So I think that is the end of my portion, right? And then I think we're just going to move on into the Q&A that Bree is going to moderate for us. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. French. Um, one of the questions that came up related to one of your topics, you had mentioned um, kind of at the end of the cover letter, um, writing the names of your division chief, your program director, in terms of these are people that can vouch for you and, and, and kind of a list of references. Um, what kind of comments can you make about letters of recommendation? Not just like a list of references, but do people need letters of recommendation? Um, and then are there other documents that people should have ready, like a teaching statement, a DEI statement, things like that? So the letters of recommendation, you'll I only need to write letters of recommendation once the fellow has been hired. 
because then they need letters of recommendation to support their appointment to, you know, the assistant professor level or instructor level, whatever they're going into. Now that's for academics. For private practice, I don't know. Um, but I would think that, again, those letters of recommendation aren't going to be needed until the person is getting hired. But I, I doubt that even someone going into private practice will need letters of rec. They, you know, I definitely have been called multiple times by different division chiefs to talk about, um, you know, my thoughts on the candidate. Um, but I really have never had to write a letter of rec until they've been hired. Um, in terms of other documents, um, I don't think there's anything else that someone needs to have prepared um, right away. You know, your every um, place that hires you may have different requests. They may ask you to submit your procedure log. They may ask you for a DEI statement, you know, those kinds of things. But let the institution that's hiring you request them. Don't do the work ahead of time. Dr. Myers, I know you are in private practice. Do you have experience with letters of recommendation in private practice? I mean, I think that like as Heather described, I think it's 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 actually fairly similar that um it neonatology is an extremely small and tight community. Um and so I think that the personal connections and people vouching for uh people is actually probably the most paramount uh thing in terms of references. After the fact, after people have made a decision. Um, they will often then reach out to program directors, other people for letters of, of reference. But it's it would be pretty unusual to have a letter of written uh, of reference written early in the process. Right. Um, another question regarding you know the resources out there to even try to find job openings. Um, is there really a benefit to contacting a recruiter or working through a service like that to look for um, available jobs? I think only if you're going into private practice, a recruiter is not going to know about academic jobs because, you know, unless someone's looking for a division chief, they're not using oftentimes, you know, recruiters for these, like for a, you know, junior faculty position. Um, for the private practices that are run by pediatrics, um, you know, usually you can just reach out to the pediatrics, you know, website in general to say you're interested, you know, in potentially coming on board or on site. I, I'm trying to think of the other big private practice groups, um, but they have their own internal recruiters, but you just need to like initiate contact with them first. Right. I would just also, um, yeah, I would agree. Like, you know, Kaiser, um, Pediatric Group, the next, um, will all have easily Googleable recruiters. Um, some of them are large enough that they have regional recruiters, and those are people um, that are easy to find, um, or your program director can help you find them. Uh, the people who are recruiting for jobs, be a little careful, because if they identify you for a job, um, often there's a contract, con there's a clause in there that the section chief cannot hire you independently. Um, and so it may actually close some avenues um, if you work through them. I'm not saying you shouldn't. I'm just saying that um, if you are thinking about actually using a recruiter that is not affiliated with a company that actually owns neonatology practices, uh, there are some intricacies there that you need to think about before you sign up. Great. Um, the next few slides uh, will have questions that have been collected before the session, but I want to make sure we get to a couple more from the chat. So this was from earlier in the presentation. So is it possible to find a more clinically focused position at an academic institution without research or publication requirements? This is coming from someone who's potentially more interested in an administrative role farther down the road. Absolutely. Um, you know, I, I, every, every academic division needs people to do clinical work. And so there are so many different roles that you can um, have within an academic division that aren't, you know, dependent on you having grant funding to do clinical translational bench science. You know, every academic group needs people that are leading 
programs within the NICU, whether it's an airway program or a you know, craniofacial program or lymph program, you know, whatever it is. Um, they need people who are doing QI. They need people who are committed to teaching. Um, you know, there are so many different roles within an academic um, division. And, you know, for those people that are curious, talk to your faculty members, you know, what kinds of responsibilities, you know, are they each doing? If they're not, if they don't have an obvious research role, like what, what are their job um, specifics and how did they get the training to, you know, be a part of those, um, you know, committees or um, programs. So there are tons and tons. And, um, you know, when, when I'm made aware of jobs, they're not just for, you know, researchers, they are, you know, jobs that are meant for academic clinicians. Great. Yeah, I mean, I think that it just the one way to think about any job, private practice, academic with a research focus, academic with a non-research focus is it's a in some ways it's a transaction. What can they do for you? What do you have to offer to them to make the program better? And uh, it's just a matter of like matching those two needs up. And so be thoughtful about what are the things, the skills you have that um, might be needed by the program you're applying to. Great. Another question from the chat um, to both Dr. Myers and Dr. French. Do either of you guys have experience in locums as a first job? Does it look bad in the future? There's just not many resources out there um, for locums. You know, I here's my thought with locums. When you do locums, you know, I, I don't think it's the right thing to do coming out of fellowship. Now, um, you know, some people have family circumstances that require that, but when you're doing locums, it's not a permanent position. You don't have people when you're doing locums who are invested in your, your professional development and your gro growth as a clinician. You are there. It's very transactional. You are there to be a warm body doing a job. Um, and, you know, I don't think that that's the right thing for a brand new fellow coming out of fellowship. Um, we, you, you know, I, I'm sure all of you know that you have your learning curve once you start um, out as an attending physician is very, very steep. There's a lot of things you haven't learned in fellowship yet. There's a lot of different um, patient conditions you haven't been exposed to. Um, there's a lot of different management questions that just haven't come up in fellowship. And, you know, it, it's, it's really nice to be a part of a group that can help support your continued growth and development because you have so much more to go. Um, and I have so much more to go. I mean, I've been in practice over 15 years and I still learn new things. And I'm grateful for the support of a group that is um, committed to me and committed to me being an excellent you know, clinician. So, I mean, again, everyone is going to have different life circumstances that you know, sort of dictates what kinds of jobs will be available to them. But I just don't think it's the right job for someone brand new out of fellowship for those reasons. Yeah, I mean, I think that I would generally agree with um, Heather on, on this, is that it's a hard job to do. Um, often it's in many smaller units, so your skills may actually atrophy. Um, but I do think that the reality is sometimes your family circumstances um, make you uh, make decisions that maybe are not optimal for your um, long-term goals. And I think that you just need to think about what are the ways that you can enhance what you're doing um, in a way that then you can find a, a job that's a little bit better for whatever your family circumstances may be. I mean, I think that a good example is myself. I mean, I really wanted to be academic from the get-go, but uh, there were no academic jobs in Chicago uh, for, I think, three years after I graduated from uh, fellowship. And my uh, spouse is a neonatologist at University of Chicago, and so I did private practice. But I continued to do some small amount of research. I continued to do uh, volunteer to do lectures and stuff. And so I think part of if you either pick private practice or um, locums because that is what your family or you need for whatever life circumstances you have, um, but you would then like to do something else. Uh, be thoughtful about the ways you can uh, accentuate your CV 
while you're moving there and then also be the best locums person in the world so that when a section chief calls people up, they say, yeah, like, oh yeah, this person just killed it, right? They were amazing, um, went way and above. And so just realize that um, you'll have to work for it a little bit more if that's your uh, chosen path. Great, that actually was a really good segue into one of the questions someone else had um, speaking about um, starting off in private practice and then um, trying to get into ac an academic position later in your career. Um, do you think it's, in your experience, do you think it's just being related to being farther out of academia or are there other factors that people can work on, you know, while they're in that other role? You mentioned a few of them. I don't know if any other things have come to mind. Um, just someone specifically, I had asked that. It's hard to do, but it's not impossible. I mean, the current um, editor for NRP is was in private practice for quite a while before he went back to um, mm -hmm. academia. Um, I know people who have done it. It, you, it, it. If you don't do anything in private practice besides practice medicine, uh, it will be a little bit more challenging. Um, if you find opportunities uh, to kind of enhance your academic um, skill set. It doesn't need to be research. I mean, that helps. But if it's QI or some other skill set that is useful um, to a section chief uh, at, at an academic center, um, that will make it easier. I think, um, you know, there, I, I, you shouldn't think that because you go into private practice, you're not going to have other like citizenship responsibilities. When you're in private practice, you're doing more than just taking care of patients. Everyone within the group will have different roles. Like, you know, they may be the ones that's like dealing with the Vaughn data or they're doing infection control or, you know, they're the medical director of the unit. And so all of those skills are transferable. Um, again, Patrick said it is, it is a little bit harder, but it's definitely um, doable. Um, and, you know, you're just going to build skill sets while you're in private practice. Um, again, it's not a, it's not a only clinical job. Like all, all jobs have some administrative responsibilities associated with them, except maybe for locums tenums. Um, but uh, you know, so again, if you, you know, it's just, um, a slightly, it's a much harder jump from locums tenums to something different like Great. All right. Um, this is just a reminder that Dr. Dias wanted to put in um, about some of the questions. We have more questions to come. I'm just going to go to some of them that have been done beforehand. So um, there are some other sessions that we have had previously that can address some questions relating to the job search with a visa. Um, interviewing. Um, we have that session coming up in July and then specific kind of private practice and academic medicine questions. The sessions on each of those will, will kind of enhance this discussion and those are um, in May and June. And then questions about determining the culture of a specific institution. Um, there's some uh, great info about that in the DEI session that was from last year. But let's kind of keep going. Um, now we might have already done some of these. So we talked about locums and um, we talked about private and, and academic. Let's keep going. So this is a, another question that kind of just came up in the chat as well. Um, in terms of during your job search, what is the best way to kind of go, go about talking about family planning or maternity leave, or specifically if you are um, expecting a baby during the job search process, kind of how, um, how does that look with the interview trail? Well, I was pregnant when I was um, out on the job market um, looking for a job coming out of fellowship, um, and it didn't impact me at all. I mean, I, you know, it's, it's not a surprise that, you know, people in their early, you know, a lot of people are in their, you know, thirties when they're finishing up fellowship, that they're in the phase of life where they're building families. So this is very common. Um, and, you know, I think most division chiefs, like if they want, you know, you have a skill set that they want, you know, they're gonna be able to be flexible with you. Um, depending on where you go, you know, how your maternity or your parental leave gets paid for 
um, can be, you know, different from one institution to the next. Um, you know, if you have sick days that you've built up, you're staying at the same institution and you have sick days built up where you get paid 100% versus going on short-term disability where you are out for, you know, you get 60% of your paycheck. Like there are some nuances there and you can certainly ask about those. Um, but really, if you have, if you're interviewing at a practice that appears to be discriminating against you because you are building a family, you don't want to be a part of that practice. Um, so that to me is a red flag that you should run, run, run. Totally agree. Like you want to work with people who want to work with you and who will support your life, right? Like just is not worth doing a job where uh, people are not supportive about your family and um, and your life aspirations. Um, life is way too short to do that. Great. I think we addressed some of these questions already as well. So I'm going to move forward. That was just talking about the geography. Um, I like this question. So if you desire an academic position at your fellowship institution, how do you navigate these conversations with um, your own medical director? And how do you balance applying and interviewing at your home institution versus other places? Patrick, do you want to start? It's, I mean, balance is the hardest thing, right? Because you're you're going to get stuck where you just feel like you're pinched in uh, between a rock and a hard place, no matter what. And just, and I think that's when you you talk to your people you trust in your life so you can understand what your goals are. Um, in terms of finding an academic position at your home institution, I personally encourage my fellows, and I think all my fellows have at this point, talk to the uh, section chief in early spring. Uh, to kind of talk about what their goals and aspirations are, whether it be with staying with the section or not, um, because uh, the section chiefs are, are people who talk to each other a lot and can really aid um, an applicant's uh, job search. And I'm, I'm lucky that mine is extremely supportive. Um, but also, I mean, you know, I've said this like 10 times at this point, which is like, what can you offer? What can they offer you? And so if the job market is tight at your home institution, you do need to think about like what, what can you do that fills a need um, that that you can then grow somewhere else. Like, I mean, a great example is myself. Like, I actually got the job in an academic center to be primarily be the point person at a uh, one of our community partners. And my first year, I think I did twenty five weeks at uh, a smaller partnership, and I negotiated six weeks in the. Uh, main unit. And um, every year uh, over the next couple of years, I had less time in the community partner and more time at the home hospital. And so I realized I wanted to be academic and I had something I could offer. And that's where we began our relationship and it's evolved ever since. Um, I'm going to move on to a couple other questions. So what is a good way to ask if the employee qualifies for public loan forgiveness? Just ask, you know, I mean, it is like no one is uh, um, unaware that, you know, trainees graduate with, you know, if you went to a private medical school, you know, over $200,000 in debt, like we're very much aware of that. Just ask. We want to help you. <laughs> Great. Um, the next question is, should I expect to have a large gap between finishing fellowship and starting another job? And kind of as a follow-up, can your start date be negotiated? Yes, absolutely. And, um, you know, I think you can, you know, I think most of my fellows who, um, you know, are have negotiated start dates in September. Um, so they, you know, finish up fellowship at the very beginning of July and aren't starting their new job until September one. That's definitely something you can negotiate. Um, and, you know, the gap, the gap that you want is really up to you. Um, but you do have to be aware of the fact that, you know, you lose your uh, benefits and your health insurance, you know, from the time when you graduate from fellowship and you move on to a new institution. So you just have to decide, you know, what you want to do in terms of COBRA and whether or not your family can tolerate, you know, if you are the primary breadwinner or you are the one that provides insurance, if your family can tolerate you 
having a nice break. Um, so that's totally individualized um, and it can be a negotiation point between you and your new boss. May also be what your boss needs, right? Some bosses have a lot of flexibility and some bosses have an urgent need. I've had uh, people start two days after they graduated fellowship because the practice really needed somebody who could help out, especially like your, um, and, but most fellows have uh, easily uh, found ways to take um, some time off after fellowship. Great. Um, we talked about letters of recommendation. There's a couple more questions before um, we get to this final slide. Um, any advice about both creating an application, but also probably just navigating um, the, the situation of if a really cool, interesting, your ideal job is posted several months before you're ready to even start on this process. So let's say if you're in the beginning of your second year, um, how do you kind of navigate that process of your ideal job is posted a little bit too early? Um, I've had, you know, I have a fellow this year, um, who's graduating and, you know, she really, really, really wanted to be back in North Carolina. Um, and so there was a posting for a job at UNC, um, when she was in the beginning of her second year. And I told her to just send an email and just reach out to the section chief and say, Hey, I'm only a second year fellow. I am really, you know, this is my academic focus. I'm really interested in coming back to the Chapel Hill area after I finish fellowship. And this section chief met with her. They had like a nice little conversation. And, you know, ultimately, you know, she said like, obviously we were looking to hire now, but we're gonna keep you in mind. And, you know, she's going to work there um, when she finishes with our fellowship in just a few months. So I think that it's okay to reach out um, to um, division chiefs who have a job posting, um, you know, and it may be too soon, but just tell them why you're really interested. You know, if it has, if it has to do with the line of inquiry or the line of research, um, or if it's in a geographic area that you're really excited about, you know, moving to, let them know. Again, the worst thing they can say is no. Um, you know, and, but the best thing they could say is like, oh, let's talk next year. So there's really no downside. Just don't bug them. Don't send them 18 <laughs> emails. <laughs> Great. Um, let me just double check the chat here. Those were, we pretty much hit on all of the questions that were submitted ahead of time. Um, and it looks like I think I have addressed all of the ones in the chat. If not, send it in right now as I go through the last slide here. Um, so thank you guys so much for joining us and thank you to our speakers. This was a great session and, and really informative. Um, I sent it out in the chat and I think Dr. Dias did as well, but there is a link for the evaluation um, and it's also on this uh, on the screen here as a QR code. So if you fill out this post-session evaluation, um, you'll gain access to the TCAN handbook and resource guide for this job search series. Um, so that's really important, uh, a really important resource to have. Um, we'll send out a link to the recording of this session once it's available to all of those to all of you who had registered for this session. Um, and then at the end of the post-session evaluation, just make sure you include um, your email address so you can get that um, handbook and resource guide. And you'll also get kind of all of the uh, conversation here that's been going on in the chat. So a lot of the questions were answered in the chat and, and that's useful as well. And a reminder here for the upcoming sessions. So on May 25th, um, we will have a session on how to do the private practice job search. There will be a didactic and a Q&A component. On June 6th, we will have a session on how to do the academic job search. And again, another didactic and Q&A session. On July 13th, there will be a session about interviewing tips and tricks with a Q&A session. And then again, kind of later in this um, timeline, closer to October, um, a session on negotiations and job offers. Um, and when you register, there's always opportunities to submit your questions ahead of time and we can kind of go through them like we did on, on this um, session. There is one question about, do you mind showing the timeline um, for the slides? 
the timeline slides again. So I'm going to actually get out of this slideshow um, and see if I can get to that. While I'm pulling that up, um, let's see. Okay, so there's another question from the chat. So this person is the sole earner in their household and her partner um, is also currently doing career training. Um, there will be a three month, oops, there will be a three, oh, thank you so much for sharing that. <laughs> there will be a three month gap between when they graduate fellowship and when um, the partner finishes the training. So if not a locum's job, would you recommend doing something like moonlighting at your home institution in order to bridge the gap in the timeline? Um, they would both have to do interstate moving. So trying to see what options are available if locums is not the best option. Well, if, I think locums, that's like a perfect opportunity to use locums because it's not like you're using it for like the next, you know, three to five years of your career. You're using it to bridge your family until, you know, you are able to, um, you know, start um, like jobs, like, you know, actual jobs. Um, but I would say to that same person, um, you should still be interviewing on the same timeline. Um, as everyone else, um, just, you know, making sure that, you know, you're specific about what start date, you know, you're looking for based on your partner's job. And if it means, you know, that, um, you know, I, I know it's, it's tricky in terms of like the application timeline, but, you know, if it means that you start your job a month before your partner um, comes to join you, like, I mean, it, it may be something that you have to consider. Um, but hopefully not. Hopefully you can make it work out. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Myers, for pulling up the, the timeline. I'm not good at multitasking here. <laughs> You're doing great. All right. Any other last minute questions for our speakers? This has been a really great session. I really appreciate all of the participation. It was great. Thank you, Bree, for doing a great job moderating and uh, partnering with us for the, what, three years now? Four years? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's been great. This has evolved and, and just keeps getting better every year. So I'm a big believer in this, in this series. It helped me for sure. All right. Bye, everybody. <laughs>